just uh, it's such a bright uh, and inspiring human being. My friend Ara Tutu Fitzgerald is here to share her art with us today. Slow Dancing is Easy and Other Stories in Motion. And this is in advance of uh, her new book coming out, Slow Dancing is Easy, Scripts for Solar Performers, which is in process right now. And Ara tells me this may be available by June. And uh, uh, so we'll, uh, we'll, we'll keep in touch with Ara and let people know how to pre-order because I, you know, I think this is going to be delightful. So uh, without saying much more, I'm going to hand this to Ara. And Ara, please uh, go ahead and take over and, uh, okay. and make, make magic. Oh. Oops, no oh. pressure. <laughs> <laughs> I just thank you for being here uh, with us today. Um, and as Jeff said, I'm going to introduce Slow Dancing is Easy uh, scripts for solo performers. It's a collection of pieces that began on the stage and are, have now jumped into are jumping into book form. And it also has some line drawings that I've done and um, photos by Peter Cunningham. And it's designed by Ola de Korn. Uh, so it's from page to stage and back again, a circle. Um, included in it also are uh, a lot of musings from the ghost of P.T. Barnum uh, in Watch the Bullies Dance and the Invisible Circus of the Present Tense, which I shared in a Zen uh, Peacemakers circle in March of 2021. So in Zen Peacemakers, I want to tell you about my name, Tutu. Bernie Glassman gave me the name casually in his living room in Montague, Massachusetts, and then added, actually, it's Bishop Tutu. Oh dear, I thought, oh my goodness, I am a member of the Order of Disorder. But tutu felt familiar, a tutu worn by a dancer, which I am, and it rhymes with cuckoo, who is my collaborator in late life. It was cuckoo who suggested that I make a book of my scripts and drawings. I thought the idea was cuckoo. It reminded me, he reminded me that the art practice, the practice of art is to be shared and it can take many, many forms. And as Bernie taught, we make a meal with what we have. And if we have, we share it. This applies to artistic practice as well as dinner. So I share with you where this book project and experiments with the Zoom frame performance are today. I have deep gratitude for the good fortune of Peter Cuckoo Cunningham and Ola de Korn as collaborators in this process. It occurs to me so deeply and throughout my entire life, actually, that to engage in the creative process is to hold gently the three tenets of the Zen peacemakers, not knowing, bearing witness, and acting on what arises. Not knowing, each piece in this collection began in emptiness, in a blank page, a still or wiggling mind and body. Typically, I think we're advised to write about what we know, and at the same time that we don't know what we know until we start writing. Mm -hmm. I remain in beginner's mind, despite practicing dance and theater most of my life. Uh, when I wrote beginner's mind for this introduction, it auto-corrected to beginner's Mondays. So, well, here we go. Beginner's Mondays. Every week, beginner's Mondays. Now I want to tell you that I first performed as a duck at the age of three in what must have been a dancing school version of Swan Lake. In that first performance at the age of three, I awakened to the present moment. And then later in nursery school, when the teacher put on classical music and told us to do what the music told us to do, I thought that prompt was utterly brilliant and true opening to a sense of oneness in the present moment. Here, I need to plug Nancy Baker's illuminating book, Opening to Oneness. If you haven't read it, please do. The process of writing and rehearsing and performing and sharing is one of not knowing, bearing witness, seeing what arises and taking action. Sometimes I'm not so loving. I think I should know how a piece or a performance should go. And rather than bearing witness, I judge or fret. And then I remember the universal note for actors and dancers is to be present, to listen, to respond in authentic action. 
So I have to share that it's kind of heady for a creator and performer in the ephemeral medium of dance and theater to see words and drawings that land on a page and stick. <laughs> Having an art object, a, a page to which to return for a dance and theater artist is liberating, intoxicating. <laughs> I'm as fascinated by the improvising hand dancing on the page as I am bringing text and movement to life on stage. From the perspective of later life, I notice how our lives link together in puzzle pieces of experience and observations that mark the weave of a life story. In this book, there are biographical moments informing many of the pieces. I hope you enjoy this introduction to these stories as much as I did discovering them. I wanna ask Ola if she's around, I think she's here to um, show us the cover of the book in one of the drafts that we did. Ola, are you there? There she is. Hi, Ola. Hi. Hello, everybody. And Hello. Uh, thank you for having me. Oh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. OK, great. Um, yeah, I was um, looking. This, uh, this book has already had a few drafts. And I, I was trying to find them. But as we moved in the meantime of working on these books from the city to the cat skills, they're somewhere in the boxes. But I have one of <clears throat> the ones here uh, that is uh, more recent, but it's still a work in progress. And, you know, we started with just a few pieces here. It's a very little thing. That's how it started at about 30 pages. And just to, <clears throat> um you know share a secret we're at about 150 pages right now on our current project so it has certainly grown a bit since our uh, very you know humble beginnings um we'll have a talk back at the end and you can ask ola some more questions then uh if you want to stay um okay i think we're going to start since these pieces, oh, where did my gloves go? Since these pieces, oh, here they are. Since these pieces started on the stage, I thought I would start by doing slow dancing is easy in the Zoom frame. So this is a kind of experiment performing this piece in the Zoom frame. Uh, slow dancing is easy was inspired by a postcard from my then 14 year old son who was away at summer camp. He wrote, Dear Mom, um, the baseball is great, the swimming is fine, the food is lousy, I miss you, love Jake. P.S. Slow dancing is easy. Well, I knew in that moment, in those few words, what had befallen him that summer. And I also realized it would perhaps someday be a title for a piece. And it did indeed, um, some decades later, <laughs> become... Uh, the title of this piece, Slow Dancing is Easy. Um, doing this for you today also gives me the opportunity to wear the dress that the designer Liz Prince uh, made for me. Okay, wish me luck. Slow Dancing is Easy. Da di 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 ba 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 do. Slow dancing is easy. Why should it be hard? Slow dancing is easy because it's almost always only about the hold. That rooted shuffle in the feet exists purely as a justification for hanging on so tight. It's an upper body event based upon the reality of two left feet. I didn't say it wasn't complex. Take for instance, two 14 year old hearts about to burst whose owners nestle in the curved nest of shoulder and neck or who simply contemplate an ear 
who can be surprised by a strand of hair, his hair in her eye, ticklish, welcome, painful, or volumes of her curls like an oxygen mask at its base. If both turn their heads at exactly the same time, the lips are surprisingly close. Who thought of this slow dancing thing? Why, why, there's the foxtrot. Oh, oh, and the bunny hop, uh, and, and, the, and the chicken, and the turkey, and the monkey, and the jitter bug, and, and the samba, the salsa, and the merengue, and the waltz. Viennese and American. And there's the tango. The tango. Follow the feet in the little Fred Astaire book. Step slow, slow, quick, quick, slow, slow, quick, 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 slow. Let's try that again. The tango. Slow, slow, quick, quick, slow. And then there's there's flick, swivel, steam, dip. These are hard. Hard enough to make Arthur Murray a millionaire and Fred Astaire. A god. Oh, oh, don't forget the cha cha. The cha. The cha. Cha. Cha cha. Cha. Sweet turn. And straight ahead. Has anybody seen my partner or my shoes? Okay, okay. Going on with imaginary friends who never get lost or step on our feet. In the middle years, slow dancing is easy because you can do it. You can do it when driving the car, but only at stoplights. Or in the hall at work, just outside your cubicle. Or at home between chop and boil and scrub the tub. And oh, hi, 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 how was your day? You don't say, where? Are you going in such a hurry? You live here. What, honey, lost your sense of humor? Me too. Care to join me in my kinosphere? <sighs> That's right. We can slow dance all night or until the baby wails. Put him on your shoulder and rock him, left foot, right foot, left foot, right foot. It's the slow spin lullaby. And then the later years suddenly wash by, waltzing right by, and then in the later, Later years, <clears throat> slow dancing is still easy. But as you can see, finding a partner or your shoes can be hard. Here to join me in a movable hug. I said, I said, care to join me in a movable hug? That's right, that's right. Pretty walker over here. Remember the limbo? <laughs> that was about how low can you go? This is about how slow can you go? Slow dancing increases the heart rate or decreases it depending upon age. Slow dancing is easy because you can do it when the flood riders rise and humming da 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 is all that's left. The invisible partner, the final partner, invisible as air. Slow dancing can turn a minute into a minuet. 
hold on to each other tight, make that minute minuet last. Slow dancing is easy. Slow dancing, infinite, indescribable, obstinate, indelible, infinite. That was slow. That was easy. I'm going to show you what it looks like. I can't have to take the gloves off to move to share screen. I'm going to show you what it looks like in the book when it jumped to the book. Here's the cover again and the recent cover. So here's Slow Dancing is Easy on the page with a drawing. And Ola's wonderful addition of your penmanship and making the page dance a little bit. So, and I particularly love this choice that she made of making the dots on this dress go infinitely up into the page. Here's another piece. This is called First Recipe. Um, thinking about food, I know um, I grew up at a time when people assimilated. And so I knew many grandmas who didn't speak English, but made pierogies and in the back kitchen and spoke languages that we've now lost, Spanish and Gaelic and um, Polish. And, but I did think that the recipes that we share are handed down mother to mother and some fathers all the way back through time because families gather around food. So this was a piece that says, I'll read a little tiny bit of it. Oops, it went away, come back. <laughs> oh, no. Here it goes. Um, I'm thinking there must have been a first recipe. What was the very first recipe? Go back, mother to mother, keep going back further and further, mother to mother and mother and mother and some fathers. Families gather around food. Oh, oh, a man, a woman, a recipe. First woman, first man, first recipe. I'm thinking of the Garden of Eden. Are you? First recipe, assemble ingredients. One ripe red apple, one Adam, one Eve, one serpent, two to four fig leaves, season with temptation. The piece goes on about Eve and the snake and how they communicate. And it ends with toss fig leaves to Adam and Eve as they exit paradise, stage right. My grandmother would call this the fatal nosh. Today, we are no longer tempted by apples. We are seduced by snack attacks and big box, bottomless big box pies, supersized sodas, bushels of fries, fillers and lies disguised as nutrients that tempt but never satisfy. Watch carefully as we waddle out of paradise, stage right. This one is called the Chalk Full of Nuts Oracle. For those of you who know New York City, and um, uh, yeah, here, I wanna move this down so I can see it more, there we go. Uh, for those of you who know New York, there was for quite a while, a wonderful place called Chalk Full of Nuts where you could sit at the counter and order a very inexpensive nutted cheese sandwich. So when I was 25, this is another memoir piece, I went into Chuck Full of Nuts. I was so happy to be living in New York. And here I was and eating a nutted cheese sandwich, sitting at the little stool and plopped down right next to me, a woman older than me, maybe 50, a little unkempt, plops down on the stool on my left. She stares at me and without introduction snarls, ah, oh, darling, one day you'll see. You'll just wake up, look in the mirror and suddenly you're old. Everything falls down all at once. Your looks will be gone. 
just like that, boom, she makes an impression. In silence, I eat my sandwich and contemplate the future. I wonder if her bitter description of the sudden fall into old age will come true. At least I've been warned. I thank her for sharing. Um, how does this move over here? Whoa, okay, all right. Uh, oh, I see, I have to touch this. There we go. The piece goes on for a while and I end up at 45, noticing not being noticed. I remember that moment at the lunch counter, eating a nutty cheese sandwich, contemplating the prediction of the chock full of nuts oracle. As it turns out, invisibility serves my curiosity. I can watch interactions between people and not be noticed. I can stare with impunity. I decide that invisibility, rather than a loss, is a liberation. Um, here's another piece that's titled, An I Thou Kind of a Guy. And it is dedicated to um, the cat Boober, who we see here, who I adopted Boober and his sister Rose um, at the Eugene O'Neill Theater Center where I was teaching. And I guess what, I, what I'd like to share with you about these two uh, beautiful kittens are the following. One of these fluffy white kittens has a black spot between her ears. Three tastefully placed black dots on her back and a matching black tail which she wags with nonchalance and cool confidence, like she knows that she will grow up to be permanently dressed in the perfect black cocktail dress. She is by nature remote. The other one sports spots of golden fur between his ears and splotches of gold on his body. With curiosity and abandon, he curls and uncurls his comically expressive tail. He looks me square in the eye. He seems to be laughing. His gaze, not the male gaze, the cat gaze. Real, deep, pure, adorable Egyptian. Instantly I adopt them. Or am I adopted? Am I adopted? I call my mother. We name the cats. This piece goes on, we name the cats. We would name Rose, Rose, just Rose, because she seems just a cat. But the other one, he has something, a presence. He seems to see into us. He speaks across the cat-human divide. He is an I-thou kind of a guy. Of course, his last name is Boober, as in Martin Boober. His first name is Gladstone for no particular reason. His middle name, the initial E for Eugene O'Neill. When Boober was about 16, he wandered away from the house. Um, when he first saw grass, because he grew up mostly as a city cat, when he first saw grass, we thought he looked at the grass and thought, oh, it wiggles, but it's not a mouse, and then decided that it was safe and he would never need a cat box again. So when he was 16 and he wandered away, we couldn't find him. And the family, whoops, and the family decided that he had found a welcoming soft place under a pine tree or tall sweet grass to rest quietly and embrace death. It wiggles, but it's not a mouse. This wise guy so full of life's joy does a dog have Buddha nature? <gasps> Meow! It was a cat with three names all along. And here's another piece off her rocker, which of course means either she's lost her mind or she stood up. Um, it's a piece that has many twists and turns in it about um, raising children in the 40s and that everything comes from the mother tree and about dancing and having dreams of the ballet and then not doing things that we used to do, not being able to do those things, but doing other things and finding tree pose in yoga and learning that 
everything is connected to trees. Everything comes from the wood of trees. And it ends with wrinkles like the rings of a tree at the elbows and the knees. Everything comes back to the mother tree and the father. Coming to the end of dancing, there is no end to dancing. Please remember this. Um, I'm going to share this piece with you as well. This is called Why Did Sarah Bernhardt Sleep in a Coffin? One of the other things I've been very fortunate to have in my life is a relationship to um, the Dragon's Egg in Ledyard, Connecticut and the Narrative Assemblage Project. Uh, Maria Urson, who directs, gave gives prompts. And a group of people together, um, we, we make pieces. <laughs> and it's very much the action of, of uh, bearing witness, of not, not knowing and seeing, bearing witness and seeing what arises. So in the case of why did Sarah Bernhardt sleep in a coffin, the prompt was the poetry of death. And I was completely stumped. And then this began to arise. So I'm gonna share this piece with you physically and then I'll, we'll go back and look at it on the page. Why did Sarah Bernhardt sleep in a coffin? The present instantly becomes the future and so is simultaneously the past, the present, instantly becomes the future. And so is simultaneously the past, the present, instantly, the present, the present, the past, the present, the present, the past, the present, the future, the past, the present. It's a continuum after all. To be or not to be. To see or not to see. To flee or not to flee. Oh, right, it's just to be or not to be. It is said that the great 19th century actress, Sarah Bernhardt, slept in a coffin. Oh, words from her come down over time. Perhaps they are true. She says, my bedroom was very tiny. The big bamboo bed took up all the room. In front of the window was my coffin, where I frequently installed myself to learn my lines. To be or not to be, to see or not to see, to flee or not to flee. All right, it's just to be or not to be. That is the question. Why did the great divine Miss Sarah Bernhardt sleep in a coffin? Oh. Oh. Slight. Shadows emerge, breathless, from the heart. Death is our own boast, the possibility that we know for sure, for true. Did the divine Miss Sarah nap? Did she nap in a coffin? <laughs> Well, how do you want to spend your life, awake or asleep? Mm. Oh, oh, spend has end embedded in it. Death is a noun done into dust. This is depressing. Let's pretend it's not happening. When my younger sister died, leaving behind a husband and a 14, 15 year old and 11 year old sons, um, our aunt who was 80 at the time said, it has to be okay. I felt this like a Christian slap. It's not okay, it's not okay, it's not okay. 
And then, and then a curious um, surrender to the loss of every beloved one and ourselves. Yep. I'm pretending to be riding a New York City subway and it's rush hour and I am really happy to have a place to hang on. I, I look around the car and I think, oh my goodness, everybody in this car is gonna die. We all get off at different stops, but we're all riding the D train. My mother's ashes were in a small box. She died in 2001. She had a melodious voice and was kind beyond measure. When I was a child, a friend came over to play and she said, na, 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 na. <laughs> you think I'm coming to play? Your Oh, yes, my mother's ashes are in a small box. And I knew my good fortune and I learned early to share with my little friends. My mother's ashes are in a small box. Ashes have a way of slipping to the back of the closet. In my anguish for not having figured out where the ashes of my mother wanted to travel, my beloved partner says to me, you know, she really liked New York City. And she never wanted to make a fuss. And so I think she might be happy to be here with us. My partner's mother's ashes are in a small box. She died in 2011. She spoke with a strong Austrian accent. In 1938, as a teenager, she had the courage to see that she had to flee Vienna in 1938 in order to be. In eternity, it is never too late to celebrate those we love who watch and wait. They know, or there is no knowing. Why did Elizabeth, ah, why did Sarah Bernhardt sleep in a coffin? Oh, I think she made a little play about death. And if she awoke in her coffin, she bounded onto the stage in present tense wonder and delight, never for a moment really believing that she would die. <laughs> the present instantly becomes the future and so is simultaneously the past. The present instantly becomes the future and so is simultaneously the past. The present, the past, the present, the past, the present, the past. It's a continuum after all. Okay, I'm gonna show you another couple of Oh, you, we want to see. Here's what. Here's what the. Why did Sarah Bernhardt sleep in a coffin? Looks like on the page. Um. And. Uh, here's some people on the subway. <laughs> and. Uh, what it is when we're thinking too much. So this is a, a piece that's in process that is called Setting a Place for Carl. And it's actually um, a retelling, it was done in 2013, and it's a retelling of Romeo and Juliet if they'd survived. <laughs> and uh, on this was a rant, which was done about 10 years ago, which is a, which was pre Me Too, but there was always Me Too. It's a letter to Lysistrata and I was just enraged. 
and I'll just read a tiny bit. It says, um, to Miss Lysistrata, care of Aristophanes, Athens, Greece. It's sent by ephemeral post. Dear Lysistrata, you said, never underestimate the power of a woman. We're not slaves. We are freeborn women. And when we're scorned, we're full of fury and never underestimate the power of a woman. Thank you for saying that. And in 411 BC, you, imagined by Aristophanes, you, a fiction, a real to me. I know, I know, all women are to some degree or other imagined. But like I said, you, a fiction, are real to me. I think you are <clears throat> effing fabulous for the simplicity of your attack. Him too, Aristophanes. You and Aristophanes, author and character together, create a comedy about a logically viable solution to the conundrum of war. This rant goes on talking about what some things had happened back then, um, in, uh, 10 years ago. And it talks about the idea of finding an end to the drama of war through erect peace. It's tragic and comic that 8,763,362 days after your plan, we still ravage the world in the conundrum of war. An erect peace could be our primary condition. Love to you always. P.S. and primary peace and serenity to Aristophanes too. Um, this is just to give you an idea of this other section. There are several pieces that came from a work that I did in the 90s, which was called The Adventures of the Ever Fragmenting Woman, PG-35. The PG-35 meant parental guidance, guidance, like when you go to the movies, that you had to be 35 at least to understand what it is to be caring for young children, working full-time, and caring for elders. So Dog Day Ditto was uh, a crazy story of inspired uh, uh, by, again, by one of my children who had written a mimeographed sheet on which it said the dog lay on the ground thinking of death. I had had a car accident and they had been very terrified by that. So this piece has um, a teacher, an eight-year-old child and a dog. The dog wishes that he had opposable thumbs, but he's very good at answering ditto sheets. Oh, and this is <laughs> Yoga Beach, which is also a part of that, um, that collection of pieces. So uh, it, Yoga Beach, um, in, in doing it on the stage, uh, happens within yoga poses. And it tells this actual true story about buying a bathing suit and about being kicked off a beach in Massachusetts. Uh, in, in Massachusetts, even now, there's 1,500 miles of beaches, and only 12% allow public access, limited parking, limited access. You can be offshore in a boat to the private beach, but how many people own boats? At any rate, this is, I'll read a little bit of Yoga Beach. The ever-fragmenting woman decided to go on vacation. But first, she had to buy a bathing suit. The first one she tried on had a little skirt that swirled out from the waist. It said, I should go down to your knees, but I don't. You should go in the water, but you won't. She said, no, thank you. The next one she tried on was gold lame and cut all the way up to the iliac crest, totally exposing hips and thighs. She knew she could no more have those buns iced and baked in time any more than she could be a stand-in for Demi Moore. She briefly considered going to the beach in her underwear, but decided against it for the sake of the children. Then she nearly fell down memory lane in a bikini, but came to her senses in a ripoff of a Speedo. One size fits all. Looks great under a towel. She was at peace in all the particulars. 
She had stopped running. This moment was life enough. When all of a sudden she heard, oh, 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 huffing and puffing behind her. And she turned to see a woman about her own age, chest heaving, wearing a real Speedo, who said, you'll have to move on. This is a private beach. Oh, oh I, I didn't see any signs, says the ever fragmenting woman. This couldn't be my fault. The woman says, oh, they keep taking them down. So what happens in this piece is that the ever fragmenting woman moves aside because she's on vacation and she doesn't want any trouble. The woman returns again to say, my 13 year old son told me I had no right to kick that woman off the beach. So the ever fragmenting woman thinks, hmm, but the 13 year old son, all right, I'll come back. You're inviting me back to your beach, I'll come back for the 13 year old son so that he can learn about sharing. Well, that lasts for a moment. She's in a headstand and the father shows up. The father shows up and tells her that he's got the boy with him and he tells her that she must leave. This is a private beach. We'd prefer it if you moved on. So, she begins to pack up her bag and leave. And she watches the man who has a scar running down his chest that glints in the sun. She thinks, heart attack. They push off from the empty beach in their sailfish. She thinks about going down to the public part of the beach. And she comes back and sets up her stuff again and puts a sign on her chest that says no trespassing. Um, here's a picture of the invisible circuits of the present tense, which will be another part of the book. Um, and the last thing we want to sh share with you today is a film of On Looking Back. On Looking Back came also from a prompt from Maria to make a piece about Orpheus and Eurydice. And in this telling, every time the story is told, Eurydice has to go through the same thing again and again. So this is told from her point of view. It was done on stage. It's now on page. And we're going to share a film that Peter and I made in, on Grand Manan in 2018. Some of you may recall the story of Orpheus and Eurydice. Or as I like to tell it, Eurydice and Orpheus. Over and over and over, over, and, over and over and over again. No matter how many times the story is told, I still step on that damn snake. <sighs> Some of you may recall the story of Orpheus and Eurydice. Eurydice and Orpheus. Among Gods all mortals, he made the song. most beautiful music. The gods wept with his song. She was his beloved, his Eurydice. <laughs> In joyous celebration of their marriage, she cavorted in a field. Silly girl. She stepped on a snake. She died. Oh, oh, over and all, over and over again. No matter how many times the story is told, I still step on that damn snake. Orpheus. He moaned his fate, the sudden loss of his wife, with such grace of song that the gods wept. <gasps> he could not bear to live without his beloved wife. So he bargained with the gods and asked to return to the underworld to bring her back to the land of the living. The gods granted his wish. Ha, <laughs> silly man. 
<laughs> oh, 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 footnote, footnote. There was just one requirement. During the journey to bring Eurydice back from the dead, he must not look back. <laughs> Another way now. Oh, according to Virgil, there's another footnote. Dear, no, oh, gosh, near the upper earth. Orpheus, fearing lest Eurydice should fall and, 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 and dying to look at her one more time, looked back. And she immediately fell back. Dying a second time. She caught her hapless empty air. Dying a second time. Hapless woman dying a second time. She complained not of her dying. For how can you complain for being so? She complained loved. not of her beloved. For how can you complain for being so loved? <laughs> Orpheus! Oh, Orpheus! Footnote. Anonymous. Anonymous. Orpheus! What were what you were thinking? What were you thinking? Or were you not thinking? Or were you thinking? not thinking? Have you no faith? I mean... Have you no faith in me? Or is me? it that you just can't follow directions? Or is it directions? that you just I mean, can't I mean, follow directions? I mean, consider me what? before you look back. Me too. You consult me. You, you never ask if I want to come back. You don't even ask if I want to follow you. Never. back. You just me. assume. And then against the gods, you look back and send me back a fool. Orpheus, you can Sorry. look at me now. Do you really think... All I want to do Never is ask. to come back to wash your socks, tune your lute, polish your strings, and listen while you sing. Give me a little credit. I may not be billable, but I'm half the song. Orpheus. The gods know you. They know you and they trick you. <laughs> They're the producers. You're just the talent. They're the producers. You're just the talent. It's not always about it's you. Not always about you. How long exactly did you think they'd let Sisyphus stop pushing that bloody rock, among other things? Huh? How long? Huh? Oh, Orpheus, why so thoughtless, my love? Over and over and over again, no matter how many times the story is told. I cavort in a field in joyous celebration of our marriage. I step on a snake. I die. Well, oh, Orpheus, Orpheus. I just want to let you know I that wish you could hear me. Many people write about it. It's so incredible. There are so many artists who write songs and sonnets and symphonies and poems and, and, and plays about us. Oh, and in some of them, I'm even mentioned by name. I'm even mentioned by name. Oops! <laughs> over and over and over Oops. again. No over matter how many times the story is told, no matter how many times the story is told, I still step on that damn snake.
we're happy to answer any questions you have. We can have a little talk back and then we can go on, on our way to our lunch or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> What? Ola, do you want to say something about the design or anything or? Um, yeah, sure. I, I think, I mean, why won't we invite questions yeah. first, just to give everybody a chance because they might want to, you know, hear something specific about your Sounds process or, or this, this process, uh, you know, I, I maybe just say, a. a Briefly, uh, you know, one of the things I, I am very honored and happy to be working, uh, you know, with Ara, I'm certainly more of a <clears throat> supportive position here uh, to her process. And it has been a really uh, a wonderful journey. You know, I had a chance to see Ara perform on a couple occasions and to see her on stage is obviously a real, real treat. Um, but I'm so excited about this book being out as it will be able to, you know, be available for so many more people. Um, and I find her writing and really compelling and, and deeply moving and poignant and hilarious and funny at the same time. Um, so for me, one of the, uh, a really, really wonderful, um, you know, aspects of this collaboration is that I get to witness Ara's uh, creative process and her questions, her questioning herself, her writing, you know, a lot of her, she presented only a few of her texts. There's more, of course, in the book. And um, I love the fact of, uh, you know, how she's able to, to kind of put her experiences uh, outside of herself in these texts um, that a lot of us share in, in terms of raising children or having pets at home or going out into the streets. <clears throat> and so, and I see her also how she, you know, she tends to rewrite the, the, the text and send some new ideas or very slight corrections, which in, you know, um, it allows me to also ask myself this question, well, how can I understand this uh, familiar text as all of them are really familiar to me by now? I read them and reread them several times. Uh, how can I see that text in a new way? And how can I translate that into a design that will at least to some extent uh, touch upon her depth of, you know, of insight, of understanding her own uh, life journey and, and what she, you know, shares with us. Um, and I find that a really exquisite, uh, you know, experience of really being able to kind of have this mirror as we go, you know, back and forth. And I think it's a great privilege to have someone that's able, you know, to basically, um, help you find out what's really going on right and i feel like in some extent we may be um you know i find that process very supportive i think that's you know what i'm really trying to say and uh and and certainly uh, enriching and i'm very excited about the book that's uh as i think ara or jeff mentioned in the very beginning uh hopefully will be published in june i'm sure we're gonna uh, let everyone know once it's coming out. So it's still, we're still in the unknown <laughs> on top of that part. Not thank nice. you. Thank you for that, Ola. And it's good to see you too. It's been a while. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and everyone else, we have a little bit of time. Um, and uh, I think a lot of people here know one another. So relax, you're among friends. And uh, if you'd like to ask a question, make a comment or share, uh, the, the screen is small enough now I can see everybody. So if you want to wave your physical hand or down under reactions, you'll find your, your electronic hand, which uh, feels kind of funny, but you can punch that and your hand will come up and then you can mute yourself. I'll call on you. Sarah, hi. Hi. 
Hi to everyone. First of all, hi to Ara and Peter, and thank you for your artistic work. Uh, as a as a viewer, as an audience member, the theme of death death as a theme is what what I'm sitting with right now, and what what I found in many many of the pieces. And and we're also here as people who have Bernie Glassman as our teacher. And and I wonder if you could say a bit about about death in the work. I didn't realize that it was there so much until gathering these pieces together. And then I realized, you know, Heidegger, death is our own most possibility, and then Buddhism, and, and it's something that affects us all so deeply, or, and me, and coming to terms with it is an impossible and constant process. And for instance, with the loss of my sister and that moment of realizing this calm, that it had to be okay, even, that it, even though it wasn't okay, and it's still not okay, but it has to be okay, that not knowing and bearing witness to the real emotional reality of it and it in our lives and how much we try to move away from it seemed important to touch. Um, I don't have an answer. I'm not there, you know, but but it's a constant. The, the, the tenets of coming back to not knowing includes knowing that we're going to die and not knowing what this all means and what the circle may be and the reincarnation or not or whatever or heaven or whatever. So I, I'm realizing it's time to make a piece that's just about giggling or something, you know, it's time to have just some delight. It was a surprise. Sometimes we don't know what we've done until we gather it all together. And I think we each in our lives have a theme that keeps coming back for us artistically. And then we move on and something else happens for. So Sarah, thank you for noticing. And yes, it's there. Yeah. <laughs> thank, thank you. you. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. Um, anyone else? We've got some time, folks. Hoden, uh, 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 thank you. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank um, you. I'm, I'm curious about your process on how you decide. Um, I imagine there's a lot of improv in your work, in your performance. What how do you decide what goes to the page from the stage and also goes from the page from the stage to the page and page to the stage like well, how do you isolate something and put it together i don't know um you know the um i am an improvising performer so in my work as a dancer i performed as an improviser and i was choreographer also but i I didn't really have a position in a company where I was having to remember movement and do it exactly because I was always changing it. So the, the language is written sometimes before and sometimes develops in the rehearsal of doing it. And then there is a tension about what's on the page and what's on the stage. Sometimes there end up being too many words and yet some of the pieces, like the P.T. Barnum pieces, have lots of language. It's almost like a short story. And I have to just allow that. Um, it puts me in an odd position. I'm a dancer. I'm not a dancer. I'm a writer. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm all, all these different things come into it. So it goes back and forth, back and forth, like looking at it in the minute thing and then reaching out again and liking it one week and then changing it the next and then finally like there are a few pieces that feel finished to me and there are other pieces that are always changing uh, or are open to be changed but the thing about the book that's so extraordinary to me as an improviser is that the words are there mm -hmm. and they're going to stay there on the page you know <laughs> so it's kind of uh, it's kind of heady in that way yeah but you don't let that the the word on the page frees it 
to you or you continue to let it evolve? If it, uh, yeah, it will evolve. I mean, it'll be, it'll be set in this book. And so my process right now, as Ola's saying, I'm sending her these little changes all the time, is to find the words on the page that I can live with right now. There's also for me, the fact that for instance, in Dog Day Ditto, it was about school, and, but it was done in 1995. And school is very different now for parents and children than it was then. Um, but I think it's okay to have the context of time, which is something that P.T. Barnum asks us to do too, is look at, look at ourselves in the context of our history. Um, so it's one of those back and forth processes that I know and I don't know. It's, I seem to know if it's more right than not, but that's yeah. also open to change. <laughs> Anyway, Great. thank you so not, much. There's not a there's not a formula. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, uh, it's Eliza or Eliza. Uh, yes, please go ahead and unmute. Thank you for your question. Yeah. Eliza, hi Ara. Um, that was so delightful. Thank you so much. Um, I am very curious about the film and how how you managed to. You know, like what say something about your process with Peter and whoever else was involved in that process of making the film. I thought it was gorgeous. I thought the the music and the layering of the images. And so I wondered too, like, did you start with the words? Did you start with the movement? Like, how did you begin that process and how did you continue with it? Um, Peter, you can talk too. Um we uh, the piece existed on stage, so the script was there. And uh, there's a field of fireweed next to our house on Grand Manan, and it was an improvisatory practice. We went out to the fireweed and made um, made shots, took, took um, you know, investigated what could happen. And then Peter layered images and the music is by Wal Matthews, who I've worked with for many years. Um, we first worked together in 19, well, a long time ago, but we do a piece in Yeats poetry and Wal's an incredible musician. So we added Wal's music and, and we shot it on an iPhone. Mm -hmm. So it's a very, it's, we call our work together pre-perfect productions and uh, it's a mom and pop shop, yeah. Peter, what do you want to say? Do you want to come over here? And... Oh, if I'll mute myself and yeah. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. Uh, yeah, we started with the flowers and the script, I guess, and uh, iPhone and uh, and uh, kind of late light. And I remember a lot of going out and shooting in the field and then coming back and having a glass of wine. It was really a pleasant process at, in the shooting part. But then we ended up with a lot of um, footage with pretty bad sound. Uh, <clears throat> so then I remember spending a lot of time in the attic with my editing thing, layering things. The layering wasn't intentional, it was necessary. And then layering the sound followed the layering of the picture. And then we did, we recorded a track too. So we could layer that on top and we managed a technique where we didn't have to sync the, we didn't have to link, lip sync it. It was just kind of abstract. So, and then, oh, and then there was something missing when we got the track and we realized, huh, why don't we try some music against <laughs> this? which is kind of basic filmmaking 101 and it made a big difference so how long did the whole process take and my 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 battery might go but while i have the floor uh so ara ara has a ara likes to write and perform and she come really comes alive when she goes on stage so in her life process is to just go through that write something and get on stage she likes to get on stage and she just it's amazing how she creates on stage when she she can have a certain piece and when she's on stage the piece comes alive and you had some of that today are in that zoom performance that was very interesting um 
But what was I going to say about that? Oh, oh, I just wanted to make the point. She wouldn't say this, but she was she was one of the first so-called modern dancers to put words to her piece, and she was she was not really accepted in the, in the modern dance community for doing that. That was kind of a sin. But now people do it. They move and they tell stories at the same time. But uh, I've been nudging her to do this book just so not everything would be ephemeral, but also because it's a kind of act of generosity for young dan dancer, or just young persons who may want to do a solo piece and to, to give this material out to the world and, 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 and have it out there for people to do their own versions, I think is a kind of act of generosity. And she wouldn't say that herself. So I'm muting myself now. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Monica, you've got your uh, hand up if you'd like to uh, unmute and share. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I had one question, and then another question yeah. occurred to me oh. was Peter was talking. Um, can you hear me? Yes, you're Monica, good. Monica, I think you need to unmute. I think I am unmuted, at least at my end. Monica, I can hear oh, you. Oh, oh, it's our fault. Okay. Okay. Oh, there we go. Okay. So I wanted to, beautiful. Um, so um, I guess responding to what Peter said, um, and then I have another question. Do you have other um, videos of these pieces? Because um, the book is great and very fun, but I, from what he's saying, I'm feeling like it's, it's really important um, to make access and archive of how the movement goes with it of the whole piece. Yeah. So I'm wondering about your thoughts about that. There are on my website, um, there are, you know, um, you know, shots of performances on stage from, you know, they're not films, mm -hmm. but they're records of the pieces on stage under a stage section. And then there are some other films under the film section. I think On Looking Back is the one that I love most of the films that we've made, but there's also one called Men Come, Men Go, which is um, part of a Yeats poem, not the entire poem, but part of it. And uh, The Sound of One Hand Slapping, which is the ghost of P.T. Barnum with a list in 2017 of just being buffeted by the news and by everything that we were doing. And there is on the on the stage, there's a uh, Watch the Bullies Dance at the American Dance Guild is there. Um, so there are some other things. There's the Invisible Circus of the Present Tense, which we Zoomed from the living room in uh, Massachusetts out to California. And uh, it's not a perfect production, but it is pre-perfect performances. And Peter's um, photographs are the illumination for the piece, which is what is the most beautiful part of it to me right now. And um, it was done uh, right hot off the press and it's 28 minutes long and was done in one take. So that's, wow. on, there. that's on there as well. It was a challenge. I'd love to go back and work on that some it more. It only took three months to prepare. Right, and then we had that one moment and it and it still needs work. It's, it's, so, but it's I'm in, that I'm reaction. In, I'm encouraged, Dara, by the uh, by doing the dancing in the Zoom frame. Yeah. Like we can put down yeah. some of these just in, in a more simple way than yeah. we've done before. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. And then my, the question that I came in with was wondering about the role of these different um, collectives that you've been a part of. Like I know you were part of a group at um, a village Zendo people, and then you just mentioned this other group that does prompts. So, yeah. would you yeah. talk a little about that? That is the most extraordinary thing to have worked with Elena Yuka Tuarque in Fountain of Olds, which is where I shared first um, the Chock Full of Nuts Oracle uh, in a group of women of varying ages, talking about beauty from 20 to 80, we were, that was extraordinary. And before she died, we were working on another piece that was asking the question of, if you could change something about your mother, what would it be? <laughs> it was unbelievable to hear 
what young women and elders had to say and how much we were together in this process. Um, and the Narrative Assemblage Project, which is up at the Dragon's Egg, and I'm on the board of the Dragon's Egg, is an incredible process in which we take a prompt and a group of actors, musicians, dancers, writers come together and make a small piece about the prompt. And then we share this with an audience. And so you learn about what this, you know, about, you know, T.S. Eliot's cats and, and about Orpheus and Eurydice. And some of us then go away with a piece that we develop and keep further in our repertory. And what is so extraordinary about that process is the freedom that we have together to fall on our faces and use the ground to get up, as Nancy Baker would say. And, and um, it's just amazing to see what people come up with. And it is a community that allows us, it's a, it's a sangha, it's a community that allows us to take risks creatively. We can't do it without that, without Ola, without Peter, without Darcy, who I think is on this um, on this Zoom, who's an incredible writer and comedian and political activist. And we meet to look at each other's work and keep each other going because it's so easy to, and I fall into this so easily not to know how to brand myself and get myself out in the world. And so to share the work is so incredible for me to have moments when that can happen and to have the people around me that push me to not hide behind a rock, <laughs> mm -hmm. but to but to do it again and again. There's also you know? kind of an intangible aspect of it in which it's like meditation by yourself and then meditation in a group. There's yeah. no reason they should be different, but they are. Yeah. And Dion, who's here today on the, in the Zoom, who has helped me immeasurably and reads my work and I read her work and you know how that is, Monica, right? <laughs> you do that in your life too. And we're lost without our deep collaborators. Yeah. Thank you, Monica. This is wonderful to hear. Thank you so much. Thank you. So good to see you. <laughs> we, have, we have a few more minutes if anyone, uh, anyone else has a, a comment or a question or a share or a reaction or... Um, I don't have a camera. This is Dion. But um, hi, hi. I just want to say that this was so fabulous, Ara and Peter. I mean, the, the um, you know, for, to see your loft and to see your wall behind you and see Peter in the distance and yeah, beautiful wall. And, um, and the every to have you show your book with mm. the uh, your drawings and then to read part of the book and not, and then talk about part of the book as you were reading that just works so well and then to have some performance I would just say one thing is that it would have been great to see more of your feet I never saw your feet I know that this is we had a question about yeah I don't have it's any... hard yeah and I know <laughs> that's, impor that's important for slow dancing is easy and yeah. the question was how far, if I get back too far without a microphone, you can't hear the text. So I, we couldn't do the whole body. So that was- Except that your, your head had a lot of empty space above it. So you oh. could have had the camera be a little bit lower or something, okay. but whatever, that's, that's we'll just that a minor point. Yeah, okay. that, I mean, I think the the um, in going forward in the future, having your book the way that you did that with a few pieces that you perform is fabulous. And I think it just works so well. And I love that film, Peter, you did. I mean, I've seen different um, versions of it, but I love the film. It's just beautiful. Wow. The whole thing is beautiful. So bravo, you guys. Thank, Thank you. you. I'll get the feed in next time. <laughs>